about, um, uh, I guess, using open source ecosystems, more specifically Skyward or OpenLane, uh, from the perspective of someone who had very little to do with open source hardware, uh, used to play a lot with closed source hardware, ran into a bunch of problems, bunch of issues, ended up um, to the point where it was really, really frustrating. And I accidentally become, became a software developer um, over the course of COVID to address that. Um, but yeah, in, in, a, in a nutshell, I was working a lot closer or lower down in the stack, in the devices and circuits, uh, abstractions in design than what most people have been talking about here. But then the software dev turned into something far higher in the stack on actually trying to optimize neural network, spiking neural network types of workloads. Um, and then, yeah, kind of bridge the gap between software and hardware to some extent. Um, and it's kind of been really cool seeing like, what kind of tools I can play with because as it turns out, and I'll talk a in, a, in a little bit more detail, these neuromorphic brain-inspired approaches to deep learning and neural nets are very, very fault resilient, very fault tolerant, you can throw a lot of noise at them, and they still work pretty damn well in, under extreme quantization regi regimes. So, you know, if you have some tools that don't work as you wish that they work, and you have a bunch of timing failures, my money's on spiking neural networks, being able to handle that. And so, yeah, it's been kind of cool hearing what people have been talking about and you know, some, some use cases. Uh, well, this, this is what I wanted to talk about today, but based on the theme of the past three hours, we're actually instead going to have a screening of the good, bad, and ugly. <laughs> um, no, so yeah, I'm, I'm building up the UCSC Neuromorphic Computing Group as an assistant professor, He's another UC Santa Cruz speaker. Um, neuromorphic, yeah, it sounds like a made up, I guess every word is made up, right? Uh, but yeah, we're just trying to t take principles from natural intelligence, talk to a bunch of neuroscientists, and use them to make software and hardware, and specifically with artificial intelligence in mind, a little bit more efficient. Um, don't really need to sell this, but yeah, power bill of typical AI workloads with your large language models exceeds $1 million. Power budget of our brains, I can kind of survive off a sandwich, which is kind of neat. Um, so yeah, just trying to bridge the gap, but it's not about copying the brain for the sake of doing so. It's not about brain modeling. It's trying to see what, what do we think makes the brain tick, right? And how can we make those things actually useful? Uh, so one of those things is physical locality between computation and memory, right? You've got neurons, you've got synapses, they're kind of co-located, so let's smush processing and memory together. Um, you've got memory-triggered computing in the sense of uh, a, a lot of dynamics in memory. Uh, here, here's an, a good example, DRAM, right? We often don't see DRAM in accelerators because refresh is a bit of a pain in the ass there. Uh, but let's say you turn the refresh off and then you let the DRAM leak. Well, it turns out that neurons are pretty crappy memories as well, and they look very much like DRAM without a refresh. Uh, so use the natural dynamics of circuits, of, of, of uh, memories that are out there in order to build accelerators. And then another, th another concept is rather than storing data as you know, floating points and as fixed precision values, it's the timing of events that matters, or that, that, that's a, what we think at least. It's you know, biological neurons communicate via spikes, and what we really care about is when did that spike occur, or, or uh, how frequently do spikes occur from given neurons? So yeah, just a quick overview to better motivate this. We've kind of seen the trend going from 1D to 2D to 3D, both from the process level up to, um, I guess, uh, memory uh, integration with processes. So we've, we've seen controlling transistors, or one dimension of transistors in planar FETs, and then we've gone to fin FETs to control two dimensions of electrons, and then gate all around FETs, crank that up to 3D. We've seen memory circuits taking up vertical real estate in the, in the third dimension, microprocessors with vertical cache, throw some SRAM on top of your processor. It's all about taking advantage of vertical real estate, and image sensors have done the same thing. So my question, my non-rhetorical question is, what comes after 3D, right? 4D, right. How can we exploit time? How can we exploit this other dimension in order to make computation a little bit more effective? And in a way, that's kind of what the brain does, right? Um, and, and so, yeah, trying to take the computational principles that underpin the brain and integrate that with silicon, and I guess the code that needs to run on said silicon. Um, if you were to take this problem from the bottom up and optimize from the hardware uh, abstraction, sure, throw some devices that have non-volatile memory and 
make them process something in, in memory computing. You could also use data flow where you, your, your data flow of your neural net is deterministic, so you can optimize for that your architectural abstraction. But if you go down from the, from the top-down abstraction, then tiny ML, compressed models, quantization aware training, et cetera, if that means anything to you. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of feel like the brain sits somewhere at this neat point in the middle with spike-based processing and with temporal coding. So what does that even mean? Before we get there, I'm gonna talk about my pain points of previous chips that uh, I taped out pre-discovering you beautiful people in the open source community. But I was working with resistive RAM and non-volatile type of memory that stores, I guess, uh, values on the basis of conductive filaments in some oxide uh, or metal suboxide. So the idea is, let's say that uh, I apply an electric field to this device, we've got the animation running, then I move ions, right? And that's going to modulate the conductance of this nanoscale thin film. Then I remove that electric field and that conductance stays the way it is. And I can kind of store ones and zeros and intermediate values as well. So we've seen a lot of analog compute as a result of that. And integrating that with silicon hasn't been too difficult in the sense that they're kind of just treated as vias in the back end of the line. And you can parallelize this. Here's an example of a three by three array uh, just for represented as programmable resistors, right? Um, and uh, in, in practice, you'll see 128 by 128, 256 by 256, et cetera. Um, and that's just a small scale 16 by 16 chip that we taped out, for, I don't remember, to 2019, 2020 or something. Um, but the idea is that we apply voltages at the input. Uh, each of these uh, resistive RAMs uh, cells are going to draw some current that's proportionate to what you've programmed it to. And if you do that in parallel, then you can use Kirchhoff's current law to accumulate current to accumulate charge. And if you do that across bit lines, then you've effectively integrated a matrix uh, vector multiplication. Um, it's kind of nice. So your RAM conductances correspond to whatever parameters or to whatever weights in your matrix. And another thing that's kind of neat is say that you expand your architecture. Say you introduce an extra neuron or an extra synapse, add another row and you don't increase the time complexity of processing as opposed to having to add an additional adder or having to time multiplex an additional uh, step. Uh, of course, there are limits to that claim. But yeah, so design some ADC, is not gonna bother talking about this, uh, but yeah, we, we figures are mirror, I don't really care about this at the, at the moment, but the point is that we, we, got some, we got some nice numbers in theory. Scaling this is a bit of a, it, it's, it's a pain because a lot of processes haven't necessarily been optimized with analog mixed signal compute in mind. I mean, if you have an analog current, if you want to communicate that to another core, to another memory tile, or to whatever it is, you need to convert that into a digital signal. So as it turns out, for the chip that we designed and the pain point of many other RAM in-memory processes, ADCs dominated a significant chunk of your power and your, your, your latency and, and your chip area as well. So we were kind of left with thinking, how do we address that? Um, removing ADCs, uh, the, the, the direction that I took, rather than just trying to crank out more value out, out of uh, data converters, I thought, all right, well, let's just do something different with our neural nets. Uh, Spike-based processing, right? When, when I say spikes, I mean something that is, I guess, an event, right? Something that can be represented via a one and a zero. If, there, if it's a zero, then there's no event, there's no spike. If it's a one, then bam, your neuron is spiked. So in that instance, then, yeah, you can sub out your ADCs with sense amplifiers or something to that effect. Um, just a bit of high-level motivation on why we might want to do that. Biological neurons communicate in spikes, uh, and uh, let's take advantage of that. If you were to process that, and if you, if you were to replace an activation in, in a neural network with ones and zeros, well, zero times your weight is just zero. Skip that step. One times your weight is just your weight. Don't worry about the multiplier, right? I mean, you'll still need to do, do accumulations and other stuff, but at a, at a very coarse grain level, that, that's kind of a, a nice little computational benefit. And I guess if you have a bunch of zeros, then I guess interlayer communication or multi-core communication is also going to drop. Or, or you, you're basically promoting a hell of a lot of sparsity. Um, it's, it's really inefficient for me to say zero, 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 blah, 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 seven. It's a far more efficient representation to say seven at position 10, five at position 20. So not only do you promote uh, sparsity in data movement, but you're also able to, if you need to cache any of your activations, you have far less things to cache. So that could be kind of nice. Um, there's also advantages at the sensory periphery where you're only 
throw data in whenever something has happened, whenever something has changed. Um, if I want to process a video, or if, if you're looking at my slides, my slides are unchanging, right? You're not really paying attention to the background, to the wall around you, so just don't process that. Only process things that catch your eye. And so there are cameras out there that are optimized for that. Um, and, and yeah, if you have a heap of zeros passed to your network, then again, it, it all kind of goes back to sparsity. So that's all well and good, high level motivation. So what, what is a spiking neuron mean, right? Uh, it it kind of suggests that we need some temporal dynamics, if I can make this video work. But let's say that we have this neuron, we trigger some spikes over time. So we've got time varying dynamics here. And if that neuron is sufficiently excited, which is represented by some threshold uh, applied to a hidden state, then, it's, then that neuron is going to fire. It's going to fire a spike to downstream layers. Now, more, a, a little bit more uh, qualitatively, let's say that my top row is, is some current injection. And if I apply a spike, then that hidden state represented as some membrane potential is going to jump up and then exponentially relax back to some resting value. That's actually how biological neurons work, right? Biological neurons have some membrane. That membrane has leakage, and that membrane is surrounded by, it's an insulating membrane surrounded by, a, I guess, aqueous saline solution. So you've got conductor, insulator, conductor. What is that? Capacitor. So you have this RC circuit. That's where you get your exponential relaxation from. If it reaches, the, but this is a very coarse abstraction of spiking neurons. We haven't gone into more detailed uh, modeling because I don't know how to make that useful in the context of deep learning, right? Um, so if I wanted to replicate the particular shape of an of a action potential of a voltage spike rather than a zero one representation, I don't know why that would be useful in a deep learning algorithm, so I haven't done it. Um, sticking to sparse representations in the meantime. Now, for any of you that have gotten your hands dirty with auto differentiation frameworks and with actually training your neural networks, the backbone of all of these models is the back propagation algorithm, which relies on gradient descent. The thing is, thresholding is a non-differentiable operator, right? You, it, it's, it's, you're basically applying a shifted heavy side function. The good thing is that we know that deep learning algorithms are very tolerant to unbiased gradient uh, approximators or estimators, as in you can approximate it, you can throw a bunch of noise at your neural network, and it still works pretty damn well. We know that from quantization aware training, because again, quantization is a non-differentiable process. So what do we do? smooth it out, like whatever. It's, 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 it's very tolerant and it works just as well. So during the forward pass, you apply that discretization of your activation on the backward pass, you smooth out your gradients in order to make sure that there is some functional learning signal in there. Uh, but then what? So, so these, these neurons are varying over time, right? So we represent that recurrently where if we go from left to right, you're incrementing forward in time. Uh, so the, per the, the goal is that we, we know how to train recurrent neural networks, RNNs, LSTMs, etc. Let's try and recast this leaky integrate and fire neuron in the form of something that we know how to train. So we unroll that over time, and then we can just apply the back propagation through time algorithm, which is something that already exists out there. Um, and that lets us train spiking neural networks very efficiently. Um, a bit of mathematical detail on what these specific uh, nodes in this computational graph mean. But yeah, as you move forward in time, your state decays. Uh, and if, as you move backward in time, your gradient for a particular neuron also decays. So just a caveat here is that this is one single neuron. We scale this up, we connect it to many, many other neurons to actually get something functional, right? Um, so we kind of put all of this uh, together. Um, all, all these little tricks and hacks and developed uh, SNN Torch. So that it, it was quite challenging to find a, a, a spiking neural network Python library that interfaced well with what was already out there um, in order to train SNNs effectively. And then something that was well documented enough for me to know how to hack it apart because you know SNNs are a relatively undeveloped, underdeveloped field, still trying to figure out how to make them perform as, as well as their non-spiking counterparts. So we, we, don't, we didn't want something that uh, abstracted too much away from the end user. We wanted to still let them experiment, play with thresholds, play with learning algorithms. So we, we needed to uh, have enough of that available and accessible to people to actually play with. So yeah, QR code, 50% chance of sending you to the SNN Torch docs and another 50% chance of sending you to a Rick Astley video on YouTube because it's April Fools. Um, only way you'll find out is by trying. Um, but yeah, so it's a, it's a Python library. It enables a bunch of exotic learning algorithms. If you know PyTorch, if you're familiar with that, then it's 
super easy and kind of honestly brain dead simple to pick up SNN torch. Accelerated for CUDA because so is PyTorch, but then we've kind of taken a few steps further and worked with GraphCore in making them IPU accelerated, but it's still lightweight enough for CPU, so that's kind of cool. Um, a few places have used it as well, which is, yeah, nice, nice to yeah, see people interested in this. Um, one thing that I'm super proud of is extensive tutorials. So this has kind of become the de facto um, training material for a lot of people in learning spiking neural nets. Um, I don't know if this time is a little bit tight, but let's see if I can give you like a quick sample. So escape, let's see, let's, let's throw some coding demos at you. Um, so the tutorials are, there we go. That's, that's a really nice aspect ratio. I'm glad I have no incriminating tabs here. <laughs> God damn. Does that guy want to move? Yeah, sweet. So, damn, coding with my um, neck craned. But yeah, effectively, you, it's pip installable, pip install SNN torch. Um, a bunch of stuff will happen, and now I've got to scroll all the way down. God damn. Uh, okay, there we go. Now, if you want to import PyTorch, if, if, if you actually want to make this do something, we import PyTorch. Uh, we want to import a few neural network layers uh, or, or the module within PyTorch that lets us actually run neural nets. So that's uh, torch.nn. Then we can compose a bunch of things into a network. I'll call that net. So nn.sequential because we're going to concatenate a sequence of layers. So a, a super vanilla approach to this is nn.linear. So that's just a linear layer. Let's say I have 784 neurons connected to 100 neurons, then that means I have a dense, ev everything is connected to everything else uh, as far as the two layers are concerned. So 784 inputs, 100 outputs, but we want a multi-layer network. So I might go, uh, well, what was the previous layer? 100 neurons, because that's got to match and then 10 outputs. Let's say that this is a classification task with 784 pixels in my input. So that, that's just PyTorch, right? But then if I want to take this into working with SNN torch, SNN torch is SNN, too many Ns, then all it takes is concatenating these linear weights with leaky integrate and fine neurons. So, you know, we've got exponential relaxation if you're hidden state. That requires some decay rate. We denote that with beta. So if I want the state at one step to be half of that of the previous step, I'll just go 0.5. If I don't want any decay, then I'll go 1.0, because there's 1.0 means you retain 100% of your previous time decay, 100% oh, of your previous membrane potential. Then a little bit of boilerplate, because there's a hidden state here. Um, and with sequential, every layer is going to return one value and it's going to feed into the next layer. Um, so we need to initialize the hidden variable in the background, to, uh, so that's set to true. Um, and then we do that for the, we, you can do that for the output as well. For brevity, I won't bother. Whoa, we've done something. Mr. Comma, awesome. And we wanna actually pump that network with some input. Let's just randomize uh, some values. So a batch size of one, 784 pixels. Cool, and then what does it take to actually run the network? Well, for one time step, net X, right? That's that. If you wanna actually vary it over time, then four step is just run a loop. If you want to do 100 time steps, then do that. Okay, so that's basically how easy it is to get started with SNN Torch. Um, in terms of tutorial content, uh, cool, nothing incriminating and in uh, recommended either, which is nice. Uh, so we'll go to tutorials, a bunch of stuff. So it's, kind of, it's very much from the ground up, um, which is neat. So yeah, fancy graphics and that. My mom told me that my graphic design career would never pan out, but um, we finally got some pretty pictures in that. But yeah, so that, that's, that's a vibe for SNN Torch. Um, I figure that people probably don't have too much exposure that high at the uh, abstraction level. So whatever, a bunch of evaluation stuff. Going to just skip through that because it's less interesting. Um, running on hardware that is specifically tailored for this type of workload ends up getting you a lot of benefits. So on the bottom plot, lower is better. Uh, using an academic chip, Morph IC, you end up with close to 100x improvement um, over, I mean, this isn't a perfect apples to apples comparison, but at the time this was the best comparison that we could have against the Jetson Nano. But yeah, whatever. So then in terms of uh, actually running this on, uh, I guess, accelerators that we're designing ourselves, we have to quantize these things. And we kind of wanted to test how spiking neural networks worked 
in the extreme quantization regime with binarized neural nets. Um, and based on this plot, blue represents using full precision values, orange represents using binarized values. When I say values, I'm referring to the weights. Our activations are already spikes. They're already binarized. They're ones and zeros. So here, we're additionally adding this constraint that your weights have to be plus one or minus one. And then we use quantization aware training to train those networks. But then the accuracy degradation was very incremental. It, it, it was very marginal, sorry. Um, and when you compare that to full precision networks that are non-spiking, that don't have these time varying dynamics, then they're, they take a much greater hit in comparison to spiking neural nets. Um, and this is just like a sample of, I mean, MNIST fashion MNIST are images, but you know, SNNs are time varying, so we want temporally varying data uh, at the input. So we use videos from event driven cameras, which suppress anything that's not moving. We've only got pixels plus a bunch of noise uh, for moving data, which is kind of neat. Um, the theory for, as to why these work so well is because a lot of your noise, a lot of your approximations are going to be absorbed into the sub-threshold dynamics of the neuron. So if you perturb the state of your neuron a little bit, well, if the neuron doesn't spike, then it doesn't spike. Like that slight change doesn't do anything for downstream neurons. So that, that's kind of our working theory there. Um, so now we're working on open source neuromorphic IP, uh, getting on those MPWs and milking them for all they're worth, which is a lot. Um, and as we know, the deep learning hype train was very much uh, because of the open source movement. So yeah, just porting that to silicon is what, we're, what the dream is, right? Um, so a couple of successful tape outs uh, and one tape in. So the, before I subjected my grad students to the all-nighters and pains of the tape out, I figured I'd put myself through it to make sure that I could safely grill them for not being able to deliver if they couldn't do it. Um, so the top one was, <laughs> I'm a great supervisor. Um, <laughs> Well, to be fair, I've been asked a dozen times in the past 24 hours, oh, so who are you working under? Um, oh, I'm, a, I'm a professor, actually. <laughs> um, it shocks everyone. It shocks myself. Um, so this uh, binarized SNN accelerator, pump it with data, fancy clock speeds, whatever. I just went to ISSCC like a month or two ago. It was just this old figure of merit conference, so I'm just sick of seeing numbers at the moment. Um, but then, yeah, we, took, we did a bunch of optimizations, and it, it, it's a really good battleground for doing these high-risk new algorithm kinds of uh, approaches that we don't know for sure work, but are getting more and more confident thanks to building tools like SNN Torch. Um, design on the bottom was, designed, it was by my grad student who just uh, defended her thesis successfully, uh, uh, which had, you know, it, it was pretty small. It was on a shared, uh, shared die. Um, thanks to Matthew Venn um, on the Zero to ASIC course. A uh, bunch of fancy neuron features. And uh, also Farhad Modaresi, uh, an another like plug for open source, right? Farhad's this uh, undergrad student. At the time, he was a second year undergrad in Iran. Being from Iran, <laughs> no chance in hell he's going to get access to any fancy PDKs. But this whole open source thing gave him that opportunity. And during his design here, which I also have to give a shout out to Matt, of course, uh, for developing OpenRAM, which was a, basically the backbone of this whole thing. Um, this was happening during the protests in Iran, where, where uh, I guess there, there was that in, a lot of the universities, uh, a lot of students were protesting women's rights in that, um, and students were getting shot, basically. Doing this was basically an escape for Farhad, uh, and it was kind of heartbreaking having weekly check-ins and weekly meetings. So yeah, don't want to make this too political, right? But Open source is very bloody powerful in that sense, in giving access to a lot of students that wouldn't otherwise have this access to education and uh, opportunity. So it's uh, yeah, really awesome because this chip, well, taped in chip is going to be, uh, oh, chip emulation, was, is it going to be presented at ISCAS in Monterey. So that's pretty cool. A um, bunch of numbers, don't worry about it. Um, projecting the synaptic opera, you know what, don't worry about that either, we want lunch. Um, Bunch of future directions. I've, I've got to um, say thanks to incoming students and students that I'm currently working with. Um, but yeah, a bunch of things that we're working on. Again, jumping on the hype train, Spike GPT. <laughs> um, this was recently released, and Hugging Face were like, "Yo, let us uh, let, let let's let's host your model up on um, uh, on Hugging Face." So we released the code for that. Also released pre-trained models for that. Um, and yeah, full disclosure, if you would actually run it yourself, it's uh, syntactically very sound. It generates text that's, that, that, that's syntactically sound for 22x projected 22x, uh, less energy cost. But 
the wording of things is a little bit weird. So we're not really quite hitting chat GPT levels at all, but we're trying our best, like, come on. Um, other things, uh, Sky 130B, we've got RAM access. At the start, I talked about using RAM. And so now we can actually build open source chips uh, that take advantage of removing our ADCs, because the previous chips I showed you were just using DFF RAM or SRAM in that. So we can actually go ahead and do more exotic and uh, I guess more dense memories. That's kind of neat. Um, some collaborators are basically making a, an analog of HLS for ML for SNN torch and spiking neural net workload, so HLS for neuromorphic, um, which is really nice. So convert your SNN pre-trained SNN torch model into some intermediate representation. If you're familiar, ONNX kind of seems to be the de facto for that, but it kind of sucks for time varying kind of things because it unrolls your entire, I guess, graph over time. That's not very efficient if you're running continuously, if you're running for 100, 1,000 time steps. Um, so optimizing that in an alternative intermediate representation that get, then gets compiled to HLS that then you can make chips out of without actually understanding how chips work could be really neat. And that's what, one thing that we're working on. Check out the tutorials if you're interested in it. Um, otherwise, happy to take questions, discussions, collab ideas. That's me. <laughs> Questions? Sick, let's go for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question to make, wait a second. Uh, no, you have to take the mic. <laughs> Sick, let's not go for lunch. Uh, hello. Uh, so kind of a silly question, I guess. No, no. Uh, so in the spiked neural networks, you showed the spikes with the decay, and then again, it spiked again. So. Uh, how do you differentiate between a decaying spike versus when it actually is a spike? Yeah, so what you saw, that decay there, that's the hidden state of the neuron. So that is internal to an individual neuron. That's not being transmitted to other neurons, right? So that has the same operation applied to it every single step. Uh, it's, you've got a global decay rate set. Uh, that, so you don't need to put any of the decay rates. or It's, it's not like multiplying it by a weight. It's just the same operation happening every single time. And because we're not communicating it between layers and data movement is expensive, we're OK with that. We're OK with non-binarized values in the hidden state. The only thing we transmit are ones and zeros. When that decayed spike hits a threshold, generates a one zero spike, only that ends up being transmitted to downstream, value, uh, to downstream layers. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi. Um, so your spike neural network's really useful for your kind of custom analog com computational chip, right? Um, but you do have the your spike torch. Can you talk about, um, I guess, the computational c complexity versus like um, other other type of like transformers and things like that? I guess for like, because you're saying like, yeah, you can use GPUs for this, but I guess well, like, what are the, do you still see like computational improvements, like just number of operations needed or, and yeah. energy, energy usage like that? Yeah, so a formal computational complexity analysis, we're basically using the same training methods as typical deep learning. So we don't see wins at the training, uh, the training level yet. We're working on that. In terms of inference, once you have a trained model, then we're reducing the number of operations because we treat it as if your neuron doesn't spike, if you have a zero, don't emit it. Don't do a memory access. Don't read the parameter that it's attached or the, the many millions of parameters that it's attached to. So in terms of operations, that's cranked the hell down. And currently, because of the lack of easy to access neuromorphic brain whatever hardware, uh, we use the number of operations as a surrogate for energy efficiency. Huge caveat there, a lot of things to work on in that. Um, in terms of a formal computational complexity analysis, say compared to transformers, two answers. On the one hand, you can integrate these things with transformers, and then you get the same complexity as, I guess, a transformer. Um, the, well, what Spike GPT did was break down self-attention, which requires matrix-matrix multiplication. You've got a, a vector of tokens, a vector of other tokens, and you're building a correlation matrix, which requires that mat mat mult. Alternatively, with what I've shown you here, that's purely vector matrix mult. So complex, your, your number of ops is going to scale, I want to say linearly with your number of, with your sequence length, whereas transformers are going to scale quadratically with your sequence length because you have two sequence varying uh, matrices. Um, 
Another thing with transformers is that the reason that transformers became popular is because you generate your sentence, you, 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 you type in your query, that entire sentence is bumped into your model all at once. You can exploit parallelism as a result of that. On the other hand, if, well, as I'm saying these words, you're processing things word by word, syllable by syllable, that's a little bit more brain inspired. So, I mean, while current hardware is optimized for parallelism, yeah, kind of like, it's, it's, it's like saying that, don't you want to start operating the moment you have something available to operate on? And so we're trying to pull those things, those two things together. Uh, because operating on things once they're available, that's what we used to do for recurrent neural networks, but we jumped ship from that <laughs> because they have short-term memory problems. So Spike GPT is trying to address that issue by combining recurrence with whatever it is that is in self-attention that enables long-term memory to work well. What is it? We don't know. We, we trial and error our way through a heap of experiments because that's just the state of deep learning and that kind of, it kind of sucks because it's a very empirical science to be honest. But yeah, I, I hope that's kind of insightful for yeah, the point is there's just so many things that you could do and this probably isn't what, what I just described might not very well might not be what we do in like two months time. <laughs> yeah. Any other question? Otherwise, thank you very much again. Sick.